In today's session, we're going to unpack an important update with regards to the germ theory versus the terrain theory. We're going to focus on the latter, the terrain theory, and talk about why that's so important and still timely with regards to COVID-19, influenza, and other diseases, not just infectious diseases, but metabolic diseases, cardiovascular disease, obesity. We're going to focus in on an oft-neglected aspect of cardiovascular health and talk about this gelatinous-like substance called the glycocalyx. And this, to me... I remember hearing about it when I did my undergrad in biology and didn't really pay much attention to until I came across this 45-page paper that completely blew my mind. Now, I just want to mention, this information is brand new to me. Uh, it's probably brand new to you as well. We're going to talk about some jargon, but I want to make it very simple and very practical. Now, why is this important? Okay, focusing on this gelatinous-like substance that's, that lines the interior portion of your cardiovascular system. We know that in the end, COVID-19 is ultimately a vascular disease. We know that people that have microvascular challenges, cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, obesity, and diabetes, all of which negatively compromise the function of your microvasculature and your cardiovascular system, are at higher risk for long-term complications and manifestations of this particular virus, okay? Now, this is a very important, that is, the glycocalyx is a very important future of your cardiovascular system. It's linked with your diet. We're going to talk about glutathione. We talked a lot last week about glutathione and vitamin D and why sulfur in the diet is so important. Blood sugar health is very important, as is exercise, not only just for reducing the probability of getting a severe infection, but reducing risk of all sorts of diseases because this glycocalyx, it turns out there's so much data on this. And this, it, to me, it's just so fascinating because it offers another way that we can improve our health. And it highlights all the, the measures that we've been talking about and, and sort of gives us a better idea and more credence to support this terrain theory and not just focus on germs. And so let's just talk a little bit more about that so that you have some historical context. And then we'll talk about the glycocalyx because to me, I, I think you'll enjoy this content in these images. I just get excited about it, but I get nerdy about these things. So you'll have to let me know in the comments what you think. But let's focus on the germ versus terrain theory, and then talk about this new barrier called the glycocalyx and how glycocalyx shedding in diabetes, in obesity, and high blood pressure renders your lung cells and your cardiovascular cells more vulnerable to an infection. So it supports Claude Bernard's terrain theory. So you might remember Louis Pasteur. Uh, these are both French microbiologists and they were thought leaders in their era. Louis Pasteur argued that diseases are caused by microbes. If you get really sick, well, you were exposed to a higher dose of a microbe. It's the microbe that does the damage, not the body, not your health, not your cellular milieu. Claude Bernard and others have said, no, that's not right. It's the milieu interior uh, in French. It's that pathogens do in fact discriminate. They tend to exploit hosts that have more deranged or dysfunctional interior environments. Now, haven't we seen that to be true? We know that underlying health conditions, and I've mentioned them a million times, the obesity, the high blood pressure, the diabetes, you know, all of the uh, autoimmunity and so forth, are linked with higher odds of getting severely sick or landing in the hospital. So we've known that, right? And we know that healthy people, generally speaking, there are outliers, of course, in any model that you look at, but generally speaking, healthy, metabolically healthy people um, are more resilient and have asymptomatic or mild cases, okay? So... What are some attributes of this terrain model that are novel? Well, we've, we've heard all about exercise, sleep, vitamin D, glutathione. You've heard about that. So let's focus in now on this glycocalyx, this very important gelatinous-like substance that offers a secondary barrier to prevent pathogens from invading your lung tissue and also your cardiovascular system. Okay, super, super important. And why is this important from a nutritional standpoint? Well, it turns out that some of the glycosaminoglycans and heparin sulfate that comprise, these are proteinaceous, you know, gelatinous substances that comprise this sort of gel uh, that gives your vessels and your lung cells a little bit more of a protective barrier. Sulfation, you've heard about sulfur before, remember? We talked about glutathione. Cysteine is a sulfur-containing amino acid that is a rate-limiting amino acid to make the most important antioxidant in your body and detoxification molecule called glutathione. So if you have imbalanced methylation, imbalanced sulfate metabolism and cysteine metabolism, 
you might have a compromised glycocalyx. So that gel-like protective barrier could be compromised, which would, guess what? Weaken your body's defenses against invading pathogens. So this is really, really important. And I can't wait to share some of these quotes with you uh, and, and talk about that. And before we dive in to this paper, I'll just share with you the title here to get your thinking cap going. The pathogenesis of COVID-19 described through the lens of an undersulfated and degraded epithelial and endothelial glycocalyx. I know there's a lot of big multi-syllabic words in there. We're going to break it down. But first, friends, I just want to welcome you back. It's Mike here. Thank you as always for being here. Look, if you're enjoying this content or if at the end you're like, wow, I learned a lot, I would really appreciate it if you could first hit that like button, leave a comment below, let me know what you think, and also share this with a friend or family member so that we can make healthy living part of our solution for pandemic preparedness and making people just healthier, right? That's the goal here, to become less vulnerable and more resilient. Along those lines, friends, our sister company, Myoscience, we just rolled out with this ashwagandha sleep aid that is really affordable and it works phenomenally to help you get a good night's sleep. So you know that ashwagandha is an adaptogenic herb. As an adaptogen, what it can do is help to help you become more sort of in control with regards to your body's stress response. So helping to support a healthy stress response. And unlike other sleep aids that sort of like knock you out and you wake up feeling sort of groggy and lethargic, the ashwagandha sleep aid helps you support sleep but you don't wake up feeling groggy. So I've I found this to be very effective, and that's why we're bringing it into our line. And what makes this particular product unique from all the other products out there is it's a 35% concentrate of the bioactive material that's within ashwagandha that helps you modulate your body's healthy stress response and promote healthy sleep. They're called withanolides. These are the bioactive compounds in the ashwagandha leaf and the root. So you can save on this new formula that's very affordable by going over to myoscience.com. That's M-Y-O-X-C-I-E-N-C-E.com, myoscience.com, and to save on this and other bundles and formulations that will really help you start to sleep better. Because guess what? When you're sleeping, that's when your immune system is doing all of the dirty work, sort of the heavy lifting, if you will, to help repair some of the damage that you do as a result of just daily living, whether that's exercise or, or anything else. So please use the coupon code podcast at checkout. Okay, let's break down this glycocalyx. Now, unfortunately, you know, what I like to do historically is share with you about things and physiologic processes that you can directly measure. You can't directly measure your glycocalyx. You can see it under, you know, an electron microscope, but just understand that it's there. It's doing something. It's offering some sort of physiologic function. The glycocalyx is involved in uh, clotting, it's involved in blood flow, it's involved in immune responses. But this image conveys the story quite well. Obesity, diabetes, smoking, inactivity, advanced age, hyperglycemia. So this is part of where advanced glycation end products might sort of damage this glycocalyx because of the degree of sulfation and glycation on this heparin sulfate and the glycosaminoglycans. Again, these are Multisyllabic words that comp they're like the bricks that comprise the glycocalyx. The way that I think about this is if you think about the siding or stucco on your house, it's on the exterior portion. It offers a barrier. It's not the only barrier. You still have your drywall. You have, you know, you have your insulation. You have all these things. But the siding, like the stucco or the the decorative siding on houses, offers a protection. So imagine a winter in Minnesota. And you just have studs and drywall. You would get pretty cold, right? So your cells uh, also need this this protection, and that is what the glycocalyx does. And in these disease states that are correlated with adverse, you know, severe COVID nineteen hospitalization and death, they are also correlated with challenges within the glycocalyx, which is really dependent upon sulfur metabolism. So lots of really good images there. Okay, so let's define what this very important future is. The glycocalyx surrounds every eukaryotic cell. Okay, so the, in organisms that are multicellular, they're called eukaryotic cells. Okay, so just understand that. So dogs, cats, sheep, goats, pigs, humans all have this glycocalyx. It's a complex mesh of proteins and carbohydrates. It consists of proteoglycans with glycosaminoglycan side chains. You know, my, you might think, well, proteoglycans, glycosaminoglycans, I, I've heard of these things. What are these? These are often pre present in bone broth and collagen, okay? So that's why people are taking collagen and bone broth, which is also rich in sulfur and so forth. Now, it turns out that these side chains that, that make this negatively charged gelatinous substance so protective is the degree of the sulfate 
and the, the, the highly sulfated nature of these uh, make this gel protective, okay? So the degree of sulfation and the position of the sulfate groups mainly determine the biologic function of the glycocalyx. The intact, highly sulfated glycocalyx, particularly of the cells in the lungs and also the cardiovascular system, may repel SARS-CoV-2 through their electrostatic forces. Okay, so let's pause here. So you're at the grocery store. Um, someone coughs and sneezes, right? You get exposed to a pathogen. If you have a healthy glycocalyx, this is yet another barrier that that pathogen would have to go through before the spike protein can then get within your cells. So again, do you want to ascribe to the germ theory where all you're going to do is double, triple, quadruple mask at boosters, infinity boosters until the end of time and use hand sanitizer? Or would you like to you know, be a little bit more emboldened and have a little bit more of a mentality of, of empowerment and realize, that, hey, I'm going to make the healthy choices so that I can be exposed to life's challenges and uncertainty and know that my immune system and my barriers are intact so that I can repel some of these pathogens. Uh, I recommend, you know, depending on your health status, that you focus on the latter. But if you're over the age of 65 and you have health conditions, you may also want to consider uh, protecting yourself as well. But so, Important stuff here because what these authors say is that the degree of sulfation of the glycosaminoglycans and heparin sulfate lining the glycocalyx is an important variable that will influence susceptibility to infection. Under sulfated, that is less of a you know less than a normal degree of sulfation or aberrant sulfation in the context of diabetes and heart disease and so forth, may only may not only increase susceptibility to a viral infection, but may also adversely impact the individual's physiologic response to the infection. So it's both a, a barrier, so the barrier becomes compromised, but if the degree of sulfation is off, what that means is that there could be increased risk of clotting and coagulation, and guess what? We see that, and complications with this virus. So Super important physiologic target that has not been talked about. Okay, so we're going to talk more about what to do now. So we know what this glycocalyx is. It's a gel. It depends on the on the degree of sulfation, right? Cysteine, sulfur moieties. We're going to talk more about that. But the point is because sulfate tends to be negatively charged with regards to its physical chemical properties, the, de the degree of the sulfation causes the substance to be negatively charged, which acts as a repellent against pathogens. So if there's imbalance in that, then it's not that good. Okay, so here's figure one. It's complex. There's images and things going all over the place. We're going to focus on the upper left. The upper left is sulfate. Okay, sulfate comes from dietary sulfur. Now it goes on to make this active phosphorylated sulfate called PAPS. Okay, so just look to the right. Now, there is a lot of sulfation that goes on in the body. So individuals who are exposed to Tylenol, people who are exposed to persistent organic pollutants, people that don't eat organic food, people that don't filter their water, people that wear a lot of makeup, uh, people that are on birth control, right? They depend upon sulfation to sulfate those chemicals. So guess what? That can deplete the sulfate pool, which can lead to undersulfated glycocalyx, which makes them more vulnerable to an infection. You can kind of see here how lifestyle comes in. This is yet another aspect about how lifestyle really matters and with, with regards to natural health and natural living and, and everything uh, along those lines. Okay, so here's figure two. I think this does a good job of sort of conveying what the glycocalyx is, and I probably should have shared this with you earlier, but what you have here is you have your uh, hyaluronin, you have your chondroitin sulfate, heparin sulfate, you have this barrier. Now, again, imagine this as this gel that is repelling invading pathogens. So again, if you ascribe to the terrain theory, you want this gel to be intact. You want it to be functional. You want it to be negatively charged and have high levels of sulfate there to protect you. So what are some things that can compromise this gel called the glycocalyx? Well, it turns out low protein diet. It turns out that sugar intake. And unfortunately uh, for me, because I like coffee, I like caffeine, caffeine and alcohol, smoking, other drugs and environmental toxins and certain medications and excessive endurance exercise. I want to pause there because I remember in March of 2020 when there was, I think, a, a triathlete who was hospitalized in, in Michigan. And so the media said, look, if this can happen to this triathlete, it can happen to you, Sally, who doesn't even exercise. So everyone was all freaked out. 
Well, we know that excessive exercise is problematic. It's hard on the body. And so we can't use these anecdotal stories of one particular athlete because we don't live with that athlete. We don't know if they're underslept or undernourished and all that. So just understand that exercise is a U-shaped curve. You can overexercise. You can drink too much coffee, eat, you know, take too much Tylenol and, and all that. But uh, important image here, figure two, I think, tells the story quite well. So here's the disease of sequela, the, the pathophysiology. You have SARS-CoV-2 uh, gets into the body due to glycocalyx shedding. Okay, so we've talked about this undersulfated glycocalyx. The gel starts to disappear, starts to shed. This happens in diabetes. You can, in fact, I would go to PubMed, type in glycocalyx shedding if you're interested. Glycocalyx shedding and hypertension. Glycocalyx shedding and diabetes. Glycocalyx shedding and obesity. Guess what? You're seeing these, in, in, you know, this happen in all of these different conditions. In fact, some scientists are creating assays as a way to approximate this glycocalyx shedding. Maybe in five, 10 years, we'll have a, a way to assess this, which I think would be really interesting. And so what are the consequences of this shedding? Disrupted barriers. You've heard the analogy, you know, good fences make good neighbors. So imagine fences are gone. Your neighbor's dog is eating your, your garden, is tearing up your yard. Like that dog was fine when you had a nice fence, but it's just like, you know, the, the commensal bacteria was fine until you had leaky gut, until you went out binge drinking and had Tylenol and ibuprofen on the same night. And then your arthritis flared up, right? So like good fences make good neighbors. So we need this gelatinous barrier. This is another important aspect. So when this happens, you start to see functional declines in various key organs, the lungs, the heart, the small intestine, the nervous system, and all that. So uh, really important stuff. Okay, so that's all the, the content. Now, what can we do about this, Mike? You're like, okay, so I, I, I'm sold on this, con on this concept of supporting my glycocalyx, supporting the gelatinous-like structure. What do I do? I know earmuffs, vegans and vegetarians, but sulfur is actually really uh, found in high amounts in actually animal-based foods. So if you're a vegan or vegetarian, you need to really make a concerted effort to either supplement with an acetylcysteine and sulfur or to, to eat a lot of onions, garlic, and ginger, right? Because we know that uh, in brassica. So that's, that's where it's found in, from a vegetarian standpoint. For those of you omnivorous type people like myself, I'm comfortable eating eggs, eating meat, having whey protein. So we know that meat, eggs, and whey protein, uh, I don't know about fish. I, I need to actually look at the methionine and, and cysteine content in fish, but I'm sure it's it's probably better than, than most vegetables. But uh, eat more sulfur in the diet. It's not just about getting more of the cysteine and sulfur in your diet. It's about avoiding exposure to environmental chemicals, Tylenol drugs, and other substances that also need to be sulfated. Now, here's what I thought was kind of interesting. Uh, anabolic steroids tend and high levels of hormones in general need to be sulfated in the body. Now, why is that interesting, Mike? Well, it's we, we now know that many people uh, who have taken anabolic steroids have actually died in the last year. Um, there's been a lot, uh, you know, if you follow bodybuilding, if you follow the sports and conditioning community, there's been a lot of people who've had heart attacks, have had a, a rough go with COVID-19, uh, particularly people who are on uh, PEDs, you know, performance enhancing drugs. Part of that could be because these high levels of androgens need to be sulfated. We know that persistent organic pollutants, eating organic food, filtering your water, not taking Tylenol. You know, I've, I get DMs all the time from people, well, my, my child has COVID. I was thinking about giving them Tylenol uh, and... and now, we know that Tylenol, part of how it's neutralized and, and, and detoxified is through sulfation. So you can sort of see here how not only does Tylenol deplete glutathione, but it needs to be sulfated, and, and that's part of how it depletes glutathione. But if your glycocalyx is already on the fritz because you know you don't exercise, you're overweight, and you have diabetes and all that, then you crush Tylenol while you're sick. You can sort of see how, wow, this could create a, a scenario where someone might even uh, possibly worsen their illness, okay? So sulfation uh, mediated through sulfur amino acids uh, are involved in the homeostasis of and detoxification of a wide range of endogenous and exogenous compounds. So eat cleaner foods, more organic foods, reduce your exposure to perfumes, you know, persistent organic pollutants. Uh, if you have the means to do so, to rip out the carpet in your house and to put in hardwood floors, to buy, you know, like a, a couch like this that doesn't have fluoride and fluoridated uh, flame retardants, same with your pillows and your bedding, get an air filter. There's a lot of things that you can do in your environment 
to help to minimize exposure to these compounds. Uh, but of course, the foods that you eat, the air that you breathe, the water that you drink, are, it's a great place to start. So friends, that's it for today's session. Um, to me, I think this is fascinating, but um, you might want to enjoy this 41-page paper. Uh, again, this was by folks over at Columbia, and then also there was folks in South Africa on this paper. There's a lot of different scientists from different universities throughout the world that, that have been publishing the links here between a, an altered glycocalyx, again, the gel that lines your vessels and a gel that supports the barrier function in your lungs with severe COVID-19. And since we're everyone is so concerned about hospital capacity and saving lives, we should also be concerned about things that we can do to reduce disease severity. So have more sulfur, avoid more, uh, sorry, avoid the things in your diet and life uh, and chemical exposure that depend upon sulfation to be detoxified so that you can um, you know, keep your sulfur metabolism going and help to support uh, your glycocalyx. Another thing to consider from a supplement standpoint and acetylcysteine, we know that uh, cysteine directly uh, in the free form like that in an acetylcysteine supplements is very effective. So, you know, if you're exposed to Tylenol, if you're exposed to ibuprofen or you don't have organic food or whatever, then you can take one to two grams of NAC before bed. And I'll put links in the description for where you can get uh, access to some things like that. So things to consider. Hopefully you learned a little nugget or two from this conversation and enjoy these images. And we will catch you in a future episode down the road. Thanks as always for tuning in. Catch you all later. Bye now.